Sure. When you said a, a fair assessment of kind of the, the, the politics around the movement right now that the that, that teachers are uh, unfairly seen really as solely the problem and, and therefore also largely the solution to what is actually a much more complicated problem? See, I mean, I personally don't believe that the reason teachers are demoralized is because of Teach for America. I mean, teachers are demoralized for many reasons, and we need to fix the system to solve that problem. And Teach for America is about fixing the system. So, but, but to get to your question, see, I, I think this is one of the biggest problems we have right now in general in our country. I think, I think people maybe try to somewhat oversimplify the, the problem. We spent so much of the last two decades that I've been in this blaming kids and families. Um, you can look at the Gallup polls that have taken place over the you know, last couple decades and consistently the American public responds that the reason we have low educational outcomes in low income communities is because kids aren't motivated and because their parents don't care. Then we have a movie that shows us, people are like, wow, kids and families do care. It must be the teachers. So now we've got, you know, we're blaming the teachers when in fact, it's, it's no one actor in this, right? Like we have a big systemic problem. We have kids who face inconceivable challenges, all the challenges that come along with poverty, who show up at schools that in no way were ever even designed to meet their extra needs. So anyone stuck in that picture, whether you're a kid or a parent or a teacher, pretty soon starts looking dysfunctional. The, the good news is what we've learned in the last couple of decades of this work is we can change that picture. We can actually redesign schools so that they do meet the needs of kids um, and actually give them a shot at the kind of education that will get them out of poverty. And Diane, actually you recently challenge that idea to some degree in an op-ed piece in the New York Times, um, raising questions about what you call these uh, miracle schools that, that I think you said were mostly triumphs of, of public relations rather than actual uh, um, academic achievement. Uh, you wrote that the news media and the public should respond with skepticism to any claims of miraculous transformation. The achievement gap between children from different income levels exists before children enter school. Do you think it's actually simply impossible for schools to play a role in closing that achievement gap? Absolutely and if not, not. What can they do? What, what can they do about Absolutely it? Absolutely not. I think that schools have always been very important in providing opportunity to children to escape poverty. But schools are not the only answer to the problems of poverty. And what has happened over these past over this past decade, particularly with No Child Left Behind, is the assumption that schools and teachers are somehow uniquely responsible, and that if you can just get those test scores up, that we will banish poverty. Meanwhile, poverty among children is rising in this country to a, a scandalous level. More than 20% of our children are in poverty. My problem with this issue of miracle schools is the assumption behind it that you can create enough, you can scale up thousands and thousands of schools in which children are making dramatic progress. I wish, I, I would like to think it's true, uh, but the examples that I gave in that article were schools where one year the scores jumped 40 points and the next year they fell 40 points. Uh, or a school where, in a New York City school, or a school in Chicago where 100% of the children graduated but it was only 100% of the seniors uh, of the ninth graders, uh, maybe 40% had dropped out and the school happened to have about the lowest test scores in the city of Chicago. We've seen school after school like this, Newsweek this week, has 10 miracle schools. And I know these guys who do the investigation, some of these miracle schools have dropout rates and attrition rates that are 50%. How can a school be a miracle when 50% of its kids have disappeared by uh, graduation day? So I think that it's important for us to deal honestly with statistics, honestly with data. I think that schools are part of the solution, uh, but where Wendy and I agree, and I was, I was reading her book on the airplane coming out here, and we agree that we would like to see a day that all children get an excellent education. My credo is actually the same as John Dewey's, which is what the best and wisest parent wants for his child is what we should want for all the children of the community. I don't think that's what we're now providing in uh, our schools, certainly not in our inner city schools. And I would like to see uh, the day when that happens. I think it's a long way off, particularly because of No Child Left Behind's emphasis on uh, 
basic skills testing. I, I think we'll talk more about that. But I think that schools play a role, but as Wendy says in, his, in her book, and I certainly agree with her, there are no silver bullets. TFA is not a silver bullet. Uh, the solutions to the problems we face are multiple. They don't involve just the schools, they involve government, they involve our society, they involve lots of people. And the communities that I've seen where schools really seem to be doing well are where all characters, all the participants are working together. Uh, there's a pro there are programs I've seen that bring together lots of different agencies. Uh, but schools, if you expect schools alone to solve the problem of poverty, it's not happening and it's not gonna happen and it hasn't happened in other countries. Let me follow up just very quickly with Diana and then come to you, Wendy, because just because these schools aren't miracles and not every kid is graduating, many of them are still not, not every score is left off the charts, doesn't mean they aren't making some progress and that every they don't beat the alternative. Progress. Well, I don't think that's actually true, is it? I mean, not every school well, is making progress. Well, there are, even in, in schools that have low scores, there are incredible teachers. There are teachers who are heroic teachers. So there's a problem that we have and I, I would recommend to you an article about mathematical intimidation. We have become so in love with data that we think that if the scores are low, all the teachers in the building are terrible teachers. But then when you look more closely, you discover this incredible thing. In affluent communities, there are hardly any failing schools. In desperately poor communities, there are lots of failing schools. Is it because the affluent communities got all the good teachers? I don't think so. Wendy, please. So here's the thing. Like, we agree that we need to solve poverty. That would be great, and we should put lots of energy around that. It's just that what we have learned, I, we have learned something in the last 20 years that, that I've been in this, which is that we do not have to wait to provide kids with the kind of education that is, is truly transformational for them. Like 20 years ago, the prevailing notion backed up by all the research was that socioeconomic background of kids determined their educational prospects and in turn life prospects. We had precious few examples of teachers, stand and deliver, you know, Jaime Escalante, whole schools that were making it happen for kids and we wrote those off as rare exceptions, people with magic charisma. Today, you know, we can argue about specific examples, but the reality is we have dozens of communities across the country with growing numbers of whole schools that are taking kids whose socioeconomic background predicts one thing and putting them on a meaningfully different trajectory. At, at, at the, you know, we, we could give any numbers of, of examples to, to, to prove that. I think about the, the Yes College Prep Network in, in Houston, Texas, and you know, it will, produce as many high school graduates in Houston as all of HISD in 2014 when it opens its fifth high school. That is just dramatic, dramatic change. And, and we could go on and on. Anyone here who is living in communities around the country, I mean, go, go spend time in one of these schools and you'll see that, wow, so, so this is huge. So to me, the question should be, now that we know this is possible, you know, how are we gonna scale it? I feel like we should feel a moral imperative to, to scale it. And, and what confuses me about some of the public discussions on, on this is that, I mean, I wonder if we're in agreement about the crisis that we have, you know, like, and how severe it is. Because, you know, when you think about 15 million kids living below the poverty line who um, you know, 8% of whom will graduate from college by the time they're 26, compared to 80% of our top quartile kids will graduate from college. We have whole communities sending more kids, more African American kids into, into prison than into college. This is, if, if we had a major kind of health ec epidemic that was taking the lives of, of kids, what would our response be? It, it would be to, to pour all of our energy into this, our journalists, our researchers would be trying to figure out a solution and instead, what we have in education for some bizarre reason is we've got a bunch of people trying really hard, killing themselves to test one thing or another. Yeah, we don't know yet how to scale this, but we're trying lots of things. We have communities moving the needle against the achievement gap in ways that are meaningful for kids. And we've got a growing research community 
and journalistic community that seems to be all about tearing down any possible solution. So there's something weird about that. It makes me think maybe we don't agree this is a pressing problem. Maybe we don't agree that actually we've learned so much about how to solve it, but how can we even debate when all we have to do is go into the schools and spend time there ourselves and see it with our own, with our, our own eyes?